Amen. Uh, thanks, Curtis. Yeah, so if you are new and this is your first time here, well, set your mind at ease. I am not the head pastor of Harvest Connection Church, okay? Um, that's Curtis House, and he's a wonderful pastor, and I've always really trusted his guidance until he asked me to bring a message on Sunday. So we'll see how this goes. Um, but I, I do trust him, and more importantly, we trust in the Lord. So it's going to be good. Um, like you said, my name is Carrie Pugh, and I lead RISE, which is our young adults ministry, and that's young adults ages 18 to 26. So if you fall in that category or you know somebody who does, um, come find me or find a staff member or go to the connection desk, and we would love to get you guys plugged in. So glad to be here this morning. Um, if you were with us the last three weeks, you probably heard Pastor Brett give a couple messages about the awe of God. And he talked about how having a right fear of the Lord can really transform our lives and bring us to obedience. And last week, Levi brought a word about how that obedience leads us to worship. And today, I'm going to be talking in a similar vein. Um, and it's funny because we really didn't coordinate any of these messages, but that's just how the Holy Spirit works. I believe that there is this message and this theme of awe and obedience that God is spreading through the hearts and minds of his people. And I think the Holy Spirit is trying to draw us in and calling us into deeper relationship with him and calling us to um, wake up and, and get our priorities straight. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I've heard it said before, when God repeats himself, we better listen. And I think he's been speaking the same thing to my heart that he's speaking to the hearts of many others with a similar message. So I think we better listen. Okay. Um, but before we get started, I want to tell you guys a story about when I was in college. I went to school at WT in Canyon. I was on the track and field team. And I had a couple teammates from Croatia named Paolo and Nicolina. And Paolo and Nicolina bought a pet hamster. And they loved this little hamster, and they named him Ricky, or like we would say in America, Ricky, okay? And they loved this little guy. They took great care of him until their landlord found out about him and said, you got to get rid of Ricky. And so me, being the bleeding heart that I am, I just couldn't bear to see little Ricky go by the wayside. So I adopted him, even though I was living in the dorms at the time and was for sure not allowed to have a pet, but... I was so excited to have a pet hamster. I never had one growing up, and I was looking forward to, you know, just petting his soft little fur and feeding him treats. And more importantly, the biggest thing of all, I had this little ball, this clear ball that you would put him in, and he would run all around the room, or at least that's what I had hoped. But Ricky wanted nothing to do with me, and he would hide from me um, anytime I came out. And the only time I ever saw him was at nighttime when he would wake me up at all hours of the night because he was running on that little hamster wheel, just squeaking, squeaking, squeaking. And I would look at him and feel so bad because I thought, if he would just let me grab him, if he would let me, I could put him in this ball and at least all that running he's doing would get him somewhere. But he's just running his little heart out, going nowhere and seeing the same thing over and over. And sometimes I think God might look at us and think the same thing. He sees us down here with our blinders on, on our little hamster wheel, just running and running, going nowhere, wearing ourselves out. And he says, oh, if you would just let me, if you would just let me be part of your life, all that running you're doing, all the toiling that you're doing, you would see a harvest in it. Okay? Well, I want to ask you a question. Do you ever feel like... You work a lot, but you see no return on your efforts. Or maybe like you work and make money just to put it in a bag with holes in it. Maybe that you have planted much, but harvested little. Well, unfortunately, I think for a lot of us, what life looks like is um, just tasks and agendas and things that just come in and attack our schedules. It's always like, this person needs something from you, whether it's family or friends, um, your employers, school, church, whatever it might be. And pretty soon, 
We're running so much trying to get all this done that we have nothing left to give. We've run out of energy. We've run out of time. And all the while, God is looking at us and saying, hey, wake up. I'm trying to call you. And I don't think that the issue is really, (laughs) here's somebody's ringtone. (laughs) I don't think the issue is really um, a lack of scheduling skills or our, you know, the amount of priorities that we have in our life, but rather our values. I think it's what is really, truly important to us because our values are reflected in the way that we use that time, the way that we spend our money. And often our actions contradict our words because we'll say, well, yeah, God is my number one. And we might actually really believe that he is. But our actions show that we've relegated him to a lower number on our to-do list. And if you can relate to any of this, then you probably have recognized that on top of all the other areas that you feel like you might be falling behind in, your spiritual life is suffering the most. You know that in a perfect world, your time spent in the word, your time spent in prayer, your time spent at at church would take a higher place in your life if you just had time. And that brings me to the scripture today. We're going to read about some people in the book of Haggai. It's a tiny book, almost at the end of the Old Testament, um, who dealt with some similar struggles that we face today. So please stand for the reading of the word. We're going to start in Haggai chapter 1, starting on verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You may be seated. So to give a little background, these are the people of Judah who have previously been in Babylonian exile, and they've now been returned or freed to return back to Jerusalem after 70 years. And at this point in history, they've been back for about 14 years. Okay. And when they first got back, they were so excited to rebuild the foundation of the temple. And they made a big deal about it with lots of celebration. But by two years in, they had given up. And so here we see God through the prophet Haggai pretty much calling out the people of Judah for some of the same things that we still deal with today. Because God is asking them to rebuild his temple. And they, like many of us would, have every excuse in the book as to why it's just not a good time. You know, my husband is in a really busy time at work right now, and we just started this renovation project at home, waiting for that glass to come in for our shower. (laughs) And, you know, our son just started dual credit classes, and he's in the middle of football season, and all in all, we're just in a busy season of life. So once we can check a few things off our agenda then we can start rebuilding the temple. And God tells them, you say the time hasn't come yet to rebuild my house, okay? But I see that your schedule sure is full of your own business. You have time for that. You say that, you know, you say that it's just not a good time. The temple can't be built right now. There'll be a better time later. 
but here we have my house that lays in ruin and it's half finished, but I see you've taken the time to fix up your own house, which looks like it's in pretty good shape. So their actions showed that they had time, just not time for God's purposes. Their actions showed that it was time to live in nicely rebuilt houses. Their actions showed they had time. They just chose to fill that time building their own temples rather than God's. And what they're really saying is we have more margin for ourselves than we do for God. And the issue wasn't with the people living in nice houses. Okay, that wasn't the problem. The issue was that all the while, God's house was laying in ruin while they were living in personal comfort and in luxury. But even though their houses were in good shape, really nothing else was. So we'll continue on in verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything the ground produces, on the people and the livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. He said, my house remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. So among many other things, God called for a drought on all the labor of their hands. But you know what this looks like in our life? When we accept Christ, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But just like the people of Judah, we've forgotten God's temple in building our own. While we're out here building our lives, filling our schedules with all these things, and we're busy with our own business, not only do we feel run down and incomplete, but so is God's temple. In our lives today, it looks like this. Not only are we not furthering God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, but we're also neglecting within ourselves the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we don't have God at the forefront of our priorities, nobody wins other than the enemy. God isn't being glorified, and the things that we're doing aren't fruitful. And here's the deal with what happens when we prioritize our house over God's house. We will never be satisfied, and God will never be glorified. And maybe, maybe you hear all this and you realize, oh man, I'm just like the people of Judah. Maybe I have been building and prioritizing my house over God's house, but how do I even begin to make that shift? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. We have to begin trusting in God more than you're trusting in yourself. Because we were created for God's will before we were created for our own. So what's the first step to building the temple? The first step is just like God told the people of Judah, give careful thought to your ways. So take a look at your life. You know, what are you building? What are you prioritizing? And another question to ask is, how's it going for you? We have to consider our ways. Verses 5 and 6 said, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are never warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And if we think back to Ricky the hamster, you run and run, but you go nowhere. No matter what you do, just like the people of Judah 
if God's not in it, if you're not doing it for God, it will never satisfy. And it's never going to satisfy because we're prioritizing the things that can't satisfy. And if you've been here at Harvest Connection for a while, you've probably heard Pastor Curtis say, awareness is the first step to responsibility. We have to consider our ways so that we can change our ways. Because for the people of Judah, the blessing of God wasn't on what they were doing. And when we serve ourselves and we live for ourselves, we're just feeding that insatiable, sinful nature. We are serving and worshiping the God of self. And there's no crop to be harvested from that. Have you all ever heard of the five love languages? I'm sure most people are at least a little familiar with it. It's basically the idea that there's five different ways that you can express love and receive love. And the ways that I feel the most loved might be different from you. The way I express love might be different from you. But one of those love languages is quality time. And I cherish quality time with my husband. Okay, When I get to spend time with him, It makes me feel so loved, and it fills me up. But when I don't spend that time with him, I start to feel maybe a little sad or lonely, disconnected. But let me tell you something that God showed me I'm guilty of doing. In times in my life where I am prioritizing my house over his house, I will totally neglect that quality time with God. And I already said how it makes me feel when I don't have that time with my husband, right? It makes me feel bad. But imagine how much worse I'm going to feel when I'm neglecting that quality time with my creator, with my heavenly father, right? It's going to be horrible. But instead of me running to God and getting that time from him, unfortunately what I end up doing is expecting Ty, my husband, to fill that void for me. And quality time with my husband, as wonderful as it may be, can never and will never satisfy what I need to receive from God. And in the same way, the life that we pursue, the things that we fill it with, and maybe even the good deeds that we do, can never and will never satisfy the void that can only be filled by our Almighty God. Because we are building all these worldly things, filling our schedules, expecting it to satisfy, instead of building the temple of the Holy Spirit where his presence resides. In verse 9, God said, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. And that's us. We're busy with our own house. And culture tells us that in order to succeed, in order to be happy, we need to pursue the high-paying job. We need to have the nice new car. We need to travel. We need the recognition. We need the attention. We have to store up all these earthly treasures. But it will never satisfy Because we're expecting these things and we're expecting these people to be something and be somebody that only God can be for us. So we have to be considerate of the things that we're adding onto our plate and adding into our lives. Because what has God started in you that needs finishing? We have to be mindful of the claim that God has on our lives and on our priorities. Because we're out here doing a lot of work, but how much of it is God's work? What are we doing, and are we expecting the world and others to do something that only God can do for us? So, we've considered our ways. The next thing we do to build God's kingdom is seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. I think that the enemy would love for us to believe That if we relinquish control in our lives, if we toss out our to-do list and seek out what God has for us, or even just simplify our lives, that our worlds are going to fall apart and we're going to fall behind. 
And maybe you're one of those people who you have the next five to 10 years of your life mapped out. You know exactly which milestones you need to hit in order to achieve your goals. And the thought of scrapping your plans and going with the plan that God has for you that's unknown, yeah, that's really scary. Because if I'm not climbing the ladder at work, then who's going to provide for my family? Or if I don't meet this five-year goal, I'm going to look like a failure. And sure, I guess I can yield to God's plan, but what if I'm the one that he doesn't come through for? Matthew 6, 31 through 33 says this, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So he will provide. And as temples of the Holy Spirit, we have been tasked with bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But we can't do that on our own. So how does God actually provide for us? Well, if we look back in Haggai chapter 1, verse 8, God says, Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. So not only does God provide for our basic needs like we just read in Matthew, but he provides the timber to build the temple. Okay, He provides us with what we need to build the temple inside of ourselves and to further his kingdom on earth. But what is the timber? The timber comes from when we listen to him, when we spend time in prayer, when we're in the word, when we spend time in his presence. We just have to go to the mountain and get it. But how much time are we actually spending on the mountain? We see in uh, chapter 2 of Haggai, we start to see God's grace as he encourages the people to complete the temple. And he speaks to the people through Haggai again in verse 3. And God says, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So he's talking to the people who saw the temple before they had to go into exile, before it was destroyed. And he's saying, it doesn't look like it used to, does it? And he goes on to say in verse 8, The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. So God tells them, look, I know that right now this doesn't look like much. And I know that you can't even begin to comprehend the glory that I will fill this place with. And because of that, this seems like an unreachable task. But guess what? The gold and the silver are mine. I have everything that you could possibly need. So don't worry about this not looking like something from the past or this not looking as good as something that you have envisioned. I have everything you need. All I need are willing hands and a willing heart. And I'll show you that the glory of this house will surpass the glory of the former house. But I need you to trust me and I'll show you that my ways are better than your ways. But the biggest key to building the temple is God's presence. We must prioritize his presence presence. And maybe you're listening to all of this that I'm saying, and you think, well, this isn't going to help me at all, because I don't fall into the categories of these people who don't want to build the temple. In fact, I'm out here running myself ragged, trying to further God's kingdom. Okay, I'm doing all the right things. Maybe you have prioritized God's kingdom, but you still feel empty, and you feel like you're planting and planting and not seeing any harvest. You're doing the right things. You come to church on Sunday. You serve in Connection Kids. You go to Titus or Brave Hearts. You have a life group. You give your tithe. And if you're doing all these things and you're still feeling 
empty and like there's no harvest, perhaps we should ask who you're doing it for and who you're doing it with. Because we can do all the right things, but if we're not doing them with God and for God, they're empty. That's just like the empty worship that Levi talked about last week. And let me tell you why these things have yet to satisfy you. Because where you removed his presence, you lost his peace. God is looking down at us and he's saying, hey, look what you've been doing. It's all been for yourself. Okay, to make yourself look good, to keep up with the other people in your neighborhood. And look where it's gotten you. You got no food, no jobs, your pet's heads are falling off. <laughs> if you didn't catch that reference, good for you. I just quoted Dumb and Dumber in my message. <laughs> so <laughs> I won't be back. Nice having you. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have that in my notes either, so I might scrap it for second service. But God's saying, look where it's gotten you. You're just like the hamster on the wheel, running and running and getting nowhere. Of course, this life that you're leading isn't satisfying because you've set out to do all the right things without me. But it doesn't have to be that way. Okay, I'm... I've given you instructions. I'm telling you what to do. I'm asking you to prioritize my house over your own. And I know that it might seem like a lot to ask, but because I'm with you, it's worth it. In chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, God said, Be strong and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Moving up to verse 8, again, he says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And catch this last piece. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. God's saying, where I'm at, that's where the peace will be. Where God resides, so does his peace, okay? He says, do not fear. The awareness of God's nearness eradicates that fear. He wants us to spend that time in his presence. And God is in the process of building something that we can't see yet. Inside of us and in our hearts, just like he was with the temple. But the blessing the blessing is in his presence. The peace is in his presence. The confidence comes from his presence. And see, what God wanted more than their hard work was their hearts. He wanted their hearts more than he wanted their hard work. And I'm sure that we can all think to times in our day-to-day -day where we know that the Holy Spirit is trying to draw us near, to spend some time with him, to, to retreat, to go to the quiet place, to be in his word. But because we have so much to get done, we put it off. Psalm 27, 8 says, My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. So if you want to build God's temple, and I mean the temple of the Holy Spirit within yourself and through bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, that's where you start, by spending time with God in his presence. Like Brett said a couple weeks ago in a message, God wants to have an intimate relationship with you so much more than you could ever want it with him. But he's just waiting for us to lean in, to go where he's at, to answer the call and say, God, I hear your call 
and I am coming. He not only provides us the timber, but he shows us the possibilities of how we can use it. He wants your heart more than he wants your hard work. But when our heart is in it, when we're connected with God, our hearts will see how God wants us to build his temple and our hands will be willing to do it. I'm going to ask that everybody stand up and altar team, you can start making your way forward. The thing is, is it was never just about the temple. It wasn't that God just wanted his people to get to work. He wanted his people to know him. He wanted his people to love him. He wanted their hearts. And we see all through the book of Haggai that through all of this, God's presence never left them. He said, I'm with you. He encouraged them all the way through. So if you are running and running and not getting anywhere, or if you're planting and planting and you feel like there's no harvest, consider your ways. Give careful thought to what you're doing. Seek first his kingdom. Go to the mountain. Spend time in his presence. Let God give you the timber and let him show you how he wants to build the temple in you and through you because he's with you. His spirit remains among you. He says, in this place, that's where I am. Where I'm at, that's where I grant peace. So if that's you, you're planting and planting and seeing no harvest, I encourage you, come forward and receive prayer. Come receive God's peace. God, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for your church. Lord, we thank you for the promise that you give us, that your presence is always with us, and that you pursue us even when we are stuck in our own ways. Lord, I pray that you would open hearts and open eyes so that we can reflect on our lives and see what ways are we building our own temple rather than building yours. Lord, we ask for your guidance and your presence every step of the way in our lives. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.